All right, guys. So part we're gonna keep building up, right, as part of our uh, lead up to various parameters. So now we're gonna be dealing with a new method called the method of undetermined coefficients. So our whole goal here is we want to solve any arbitrary second order equation of the form a y prime prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to g of t, and we're going to limit ourselves right now where g of t is only the sum and product of the, the following three functions, types of functions, polynomials, exponentials, and sinusoidal. Now I'm going to outline the method, then we're going to go over rules for picking out our uh, trial or guess function. I like to say guess, so I'm going to keep saying guess. And then we're going to do a problem, and then you should be good to go. Okay. So first things first. I haven't introduced this term yet, but complementary solution, yc, is just what you get when you solve this equation when the right-hand side is equal to zero. And you've been doing that for the past uh, two or three sections. So don't be intimidated by that. Um, you've been doing it all along. Keep doing what you're doing. Get the right answer, and then we're going to build up from there. After that, we're going to make some appropriate guess, guess in quotations, because there's rules and there's uh, certain things that you can and can't do when making this guess. And we're not going to just arbitrarily throw some functions on the board and be able, and try to find a solution. That's just not how math works. So, yeah, given our rules that I'll go over in a second, um, we're going to make a guess. Next, we have to check for redundancy between our guess and the complementary solution yc. And if any redundancy exists, we're going to multiply by t on the guess. Okay, not complementary. On the guess in order to resolve this issue. And I'll go over this a little bit more. Finally. Now you're going to plug in your for sure final guess into a y prime prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to g of t. Cool. After that, you're going to have all these arbitrary constants that you're going to have to solve for in order to uh, find your particular solution, which is y p. And then the general solution is just given as the sum of the two. Again, exploiting the linearity of everything that we're doing so far. Cool, so kind of a mouthful, so let's break it up. And then, oh, finally, yeah, sorry. Uh, apply your initial conditions after after you do this, after this point. Okay, this is very classic, that people will start applying their initial conditions after doing step one. Uh, don't do that. Apply your initial conditions here. Okay, cool. So let's go over for rules for your guess y, p of t. So the overall theme of this and why we restrict ourselves to polynomial sinusoids and exponentials is because just at the end of the day, your guess must incorporate all possible derivatives of the right-hand side g of t in a closed form. So if we have exponentials of the form e to the at, uh, when we take derivatives of this, like we're always going to get some sort of constant in the front, which is going to be first derivative of this is just a times e to the at, second derivative is a squared e to the at, yada, 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 keep going, right? Our guess for this, therefore, is going to be something like some arbitrary constant a times e to the at. This incorporates all possible derivatives of this, right? You can keep taking derivatives. It's always just going to be a constant in the front times e to the at. Cool. If we have sinusoids, uh, so we're going to split it up into two, right? If g of t has sine of omega t in it, then the guess is something. If g of t has cosine of omega t, then the guess has something. Okay. I put them very close together because the guess for both of these is the exact same, and I want to stress this. When you take the derivative of sine, you get cosine. When you take the derivative of cosine, you get minus sine. Derivative of minus sine is minus cosine. Derivative of minus cosine is sine. So they oscillate between sine and cosine, right, when you take derivatives. Same thing for cosine. If I started with cosine, take the derivative of that, I get minus sine. Derivative of minus sine, minus cosine. Derivative of minus cosine, sine. And it keeps going like that. Therefore, in order to incorporate all the possible derivatives in a closed form for both sine and cosine, our guess has to be a sine omega t, so same frequency, plus b cosine omega t. Got a little too excited there, I think. So it's the same for both of these, so keep that in mind. So polynomials of the form t to the n where n is an integer greater than or equal to zero. And sorry, I should have kind of expanded there. Um, yeah, so it's going to be an integer, so it could be t squared, t cubed, t to the four. 
What if it was t to the 0.5? You're asking, why can't that work? Because if you take derivatives of that, we're not eventually going to get down to uh, t to the 0. We're going to skip it and go t minus 0.5, and then we don't get a closed form, right? Because when we get t to the 0 and we get a constant and we take derivative of that, we get 0, which is what we want. We want to get some closed form of this. So using that, the guess for t to the n would be something like, let's see how I wrote it here. OK, so this would be a t to the n plus b t to the n minus 1, right? Because when you take derivatives of this, you're just going to keep going down until eventually you hit the constant, right? I'm going to write just plus c. And here is uh, until it goes all the way down. And so to illustrate this further, let's say we want to take the guess of t cubed. Then the guess of t cubed is nothing more than a t cubed plus b t squared plus c t plus d. In here is incorporated all the possible derivatives of t cubed. So we're good. All right, great. So you know how to take the guesses for all three. Now we get into a little bit more complicated about what about if we have the sum of something, right? How do we take care of this? This is where linearity is a very beautiful thing. We can just take the guesses of each of them individually and just add them together. So the guess for 7e to the 3t is just a e to the 3t. And the guess for cosine of 8t of eight is then you would plus b cosine 8t. And remember, you have to have that sine as well. So plus c sine of 8t. And that would be your guess if that was your g of t on the right hand side. Now, what about products of functions? So here we have 8 e to the 4t times t squared. So what would our guess be here? Again, exploit the linearity of this. We take our guess for e to the 4t, and that would be a times e to the 4t. Actually, let me do the t squared one first, because I know where this is going. The guess for t squared would be a t squared plus b t plus c, right? And then the guess for a for e to the 4t, right, would be, in this case, if we keep our convention, d e to the 4t. Um, without me telling you anything, naturally, I would hope that some of you would want to just multiply these two together, in which case you're right, you should do that. Therefore, your guess is d e to the 4t times, it's really bad, parentheses. I should also click on eraser when I want to erase things. Okay. A t squared plus b t plus c. Good. And this is perfectly valid. Don't get me wrong. This is something that if I saw on a test or quiz, I would give full credit for. But notice something here. We have arbitrary constant d multiplied onto all these arbitrary constants a, b, and c. What does that kind of imply? The d just gets absorbed into these arbitrary constants. So really, we can just absorb constants in order to make our life easier, because we have to actually solve for each of these a, b, c, and d's. We don't have to solve for d in this case, because it's already incorporated when we solve a, b, and c. So if you want to save time, and I highly, highly recommend that you do this, just write it this way, because it's the same thing. They're the same thing, because of constant absorption. Okay. That's how we take our guesses. Uh, practice this a lot, because I know it can get a little confusing and you may need more practice than what is just on here, but that's okay. So, and then what about redundancy, the last thing I talked about? Um, in order to really illustrate redundancy, we have to do a full problem, and so we'll just do one last problem and then call it a video, right? So, first things first. What do we want to do here? We always want to solve the complementary uh, part of this first. So, let's make this lambda squared minus 5 lambda plus 4 is equal to 0, right? That should be the complementary, or how you solve complementary here. From here, we can see that our roots are going to be given as lambda minus 4 times lambda minus 1 is equal to 0. Therefore, our yc of t is c1 Oh, I should write here, lambda, therefore, if it's not obvious, should be 4 or 1. c1 e to the 4t plus c2 e to the t. Right? Cool. So, 
after that, so after that we want to actually make our guess, right? It seems like the next appropriate thing to do. So our right hand side is 2e to the t. So our initial guess would have to be a times e to the t. Now, remember, redundancy, what does that mean? Look here, we have c2 e to the t, and we also have some arbitrary constant times e to the t here. If we try to use this guess for trying to determine what a is, we're going we're gonna to end up with an impossible uh, set of equations, as in we're not going to be able to find any a that satisfies this. Therefore, you're going to kind of be stuck uh, on this problem technically forever. So what you do is you multiply by t. So you put a t right here. So really, your improved guess, I guess, is a t e to the t. And this is what you use. Cool. So now the next step is to plug in this into here, right? So let's calculate some derivatives, because we need that in order to uh, figure this out. Y p prime, that's going to be given as, I'm going to go ahead and put the a out a, and then here it's going to be t e to the t plus e to the t, right? And then y p double prime is same thing. So if we just took the derivative of this, this second term e to the t right here would just give us an a e to the t. And then this term right here is exactly what we had before. So taking the derivative of that would give us what we have up above here, right? It's okay if you can't uh, kind of think through derivatives like this, it's fine. You can expand everything and then take derivatives. I'm just doing this for sake of time. And then yp prime prime can be written as 2a e to the t plus a t e to the t. Cool. Now, we have all three things that we need in order to plug into our original Diffie Q. So let's go ahead and do that. Then... And this is how I write it. This is how I think more uh, you keep yourself organized, which is a good thing. So let me remind you, our diffie Q is y prime prime minus 5 y prime uh, plus 4y. Yeah, plus 4y is equal to 2 e to the t. Now, y prime prime, that is this one. So I'm going to write it here. That is 2a e to the t plus a t e to the t minus 5. So I'm going to put a minus 5 here and then multiply by my y p prime, which up there was a e, oh, you can't really see it, a times t e to the t plus a e to the t, which I'm going to go ahead and expand for reasons that will become a little bit more obvious in a second. Basically, I want to line up all my coefficients in case you, you can't wait for me to tell you. Um, plus a t e to the t. And then I have a plus 4 over here, so I'm going to plus 4 my original guess, which was 0 a e to the t plus a t e to the t. I just put the 0 just for consistency. Um, and so when we do this, right? Oh, why is it doing that? It's weird. OK, let me just zoom down a little bit. Once we do this, right, all of this, whatever this sum is, should equal what? It should equal what we had on the right-hand side. That's kind of the whole point of this method. So solving this down, let's look at the at e to the t's first. So this, we have a 1 at to the et over here, minus 5 of those plus 4, which nets 0, right? 0 at e to the, which is good because we don't have a uh, t e to the t over here. So, thank god. Okay. Then here, what do we get? We get 2 minus 5 plus 4. So that'll give me a minus 3, right? Assuming I did my math correctly. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I didn't mean plus 4, because this is a plus 4 times 0. So it's really 2 minus 5. So that's a minus 3 a e to the t. Cool. So what does this mean here? This means that this minus 3a has to equivalently be 2. Therefore, we just have to solve minus 3a is equal to 2, 
which means that a is going to equal to minus 2 thirds. And there we go. We've solved for that. And then the last step was, the last required step, we don't have initial conditions, so we don't have to worry about that, um, is to write our final solution, which if you defined everything correctly, I'm okay. Well, personally, I'm okay, unless I'm your TA or someone else tells you that you can do this. You can just write this. And if I can clearly see what YP and YC are, then full credit, right? But otherwise, this is nothing more than just C1 e to the T plus C2 e to the 4T minus 2 thirds. And then what was our guess, right? Remember, it's not just e to the T. Our guess was A times T e to the T. So this is minus 2 thirds T e to the T. And that is our final answer. So good. Awesome. Uh, I want to make a quick note. I'm going to be skipping section 4.6 because really all it is is just applying this method to mass spring oscillator scenarios. So they're going to tell you that the forcing function is going to be some sort of sinusoid, uh, polynomial, or exponential. And so since I've already kind of done those, um, really just apply this method and that's the whole point of 4.6. So the next section is variation parameters, and with that, we finish this chapter, so stay tuned for that.